taking that and for putting that together. You can be seated this morning. Happy Mother's Day. How we doing? Moms, we're doing all right? So far? So far, so good. Okay, don't get used to it. Well, hey, uh, most of you know we're in a series uh, in the book of 1 John. We've been going through the book of 1 John for a few months. We're going to push pause on that for this week, and I thought it would be nice to give you a little break. I'm just going to um, actually just give you a nice little Mother's Day poem uh, for you moms today. Is that all right, moms? No, the guys are like, no, the girl. I'm, I'm taking a survey. It's a nice poem. I, I think you'll like it. It's actually a special poem. It's for moms. I didn't write it. Okay, I'll just put that out there. I didn't write the poem. Uh, it's actually an ancient Hebrew poem. It's an interesting poem because it's actually uh, 22 verses, 22 stanzas, and each of those verses start with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's an acrostic poem. And the reason that they actually wrote it in that way, that the author wrote it in that way, is that they did that at different times to say, like, here's the A to Z on whatever the thing is we're going to talk about. Psalm 119 is the best example of that uh, in the Old Testament where each of those sections in, it begins in a different letter. And they're kind of saying, the author's saying, like, this is the beginning to the end on the topic that we're going to talk about. And that's where this poem will actually go today. In addition to that, it's, it's a really good poem for Mother's Day because this is a poem um, that a mother actually gave to her son, and she gave it to her son to help guide him in the most important decision that he would make in his entire life. So mom gave this to son, Son wrote it down in Scripture uh, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and we now have it. I would also say that this is a poem that has been severely misunderstood, uh, severely derided uh, in our culture. It actually still invokes feelings in some people of guilt, shame, anger, and frustration. If you're wondering why I have the podium up here this morning and not the table where I usually do, it's because I went in the back to find the biggest thing that I could to stand behind so that if you start to throw things at me, when I announce our sermon passage for this morning is the poem found in Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. You could take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, and I know as soon as I say it, maybe one or two of you still think, great, here we go. It's the checklist. Here's all the ways I don't measure up. I'm glad I came to church on Mother's Day so I could feel really guilty when I go out for Mother's Day lunch afterwards. My goal today, ladies, like, this is really important, okay? My goal today is to change that perspective. As you're going to hear, as I've been reading and studying and seeing some different perspectives on this, it's interesting some of the things that have come up, but I want you to see that, that this poem today, all the things I said about it earlier are true. It's written, uh, we have it recorded in, Psalm, uh, in, in Proverbs 31, um, and it's written, King Lemuel wrote it. There's some debate about who he is, but he wrote the words of his mother. As he is, she is relating to him, this is what you look for in an excellent wife. And they wrote it as an acrostic poem to say, hey, here's A to Z on this topic. And what has often happened is that, that Christians have seen this as kind of like a list, a checklist to measure up to. And it becomes depressing, it becomes disheartening, it becomes like this oppressive blueprint for the perfect woman, right? I won't ask you to raise your hand, gals, but this is how some of us have viewed this. In fact, I surveyed a variety of ladies as I was asking, as I was thinking about taking my life into my own hands and preaching Proverbs 31. And I got a variety of responses, and many of those initially were like, I know it's in the Bible, but oh, right? Here's the goal, okay? What I want you to see is that this poem is, in fact, not disheartening, not oppressive. It's actually a biblical vision. It's an encouraging portrait of what God has for his daughters. All of you in here who are ladies, who are females, young ladies all the way up, all of you, in a sense, are God's daughters, okay? And God has a design for you, and God has desires for you. He has designs and desires for your flourishing, for your strength, for your beauty, for all of the things that Scripture talks about. And this poem is a piece of that. Now, one of the interesting things that happened in my sermon prep this week is um, I did the normal stuff. You know, I, I actually have my study notes with me. We're going to talk about those in a minute. But I printed it out, and I marked it up, and I did the inductive Bible study. I got the uh, commentaries, read a lot of different commentaries on it. But then I did one other thing. I actually went and I looked up a bunch of different articles on the Proverbs 31 woman. And I tried to get a bunch of articles from ladies 
and different perspectives on the Proverbs 31 woman. I read one gal who was a raging liberal feminist. That was interesting. I can get you that later if you'd like it. She was a little upset with Proverbs 31, as one would imagine. But I read a bunch of articles from gals who I found very helpful in understanding this from a, a lady's perspective. In fact, uh, in the sermon supplement, if you get that on the back table, if you get it online or on the app, I've linked to four of those that are really helpful. If you'd like to read some of those things, very helpful. But here are some of the things that those gals had to say. One said this, that the Proverbs 31 is a vision of what can be, a vision of what you can strive for rather than a standard that is meant to crush and punish you. You see the difference? It's something that we can have a vision and strive for rather than something that God is saying, here's all the things that you're not. Another gal said this, the Proverbs 31 woman is an ideal. This is true. This is not wisdom personified, okay? This is not, uh, this is not a, one particular woman who they just wrote down all these things about her. This is an ideal, but it's an ideal to help us paint a picture of what can be. And this gal said, the Proverbs 31 woman is an ideal, Ideals are supposed to be an inspiring vision of what could be, not a laundry, discouraging laundry list of what isn't. Ideals show opportunity. One more. So the visions of what could be are intimidating. Would we agree with that? Visions of what could be. Sometimes visions of what could be. Somebody lays that out for you. She's like, man, that's really intimidating. But think about it like this. But to erase them is to limit ourselves to only what exists right now. We take all of those ideals, biblical ideals, and we put them on the shelf. We're limited to where we're at right now. We know that God doesn't want that for us. So I would suggest that God has this in Scripture for a reason. That it's a, a mother telling a son, this is what you look for in an excellent wife. And it's the Spirit of God telling our Christian ladies today, this is God's dream for you. This is God's desire for you. This is a vision of what can be, and it's supposed to be encouraging. It's supposed to be uplifting. So if you think and feel things that are discouraging, you realize that those don't come from the Spirit of God. Those come from our own misunderstandings of the text. Those come from our own ways that we've seen this misused and abused. But God wants good things for his daughters from this text. Okay? I told the first service this. I'm going to give you permission to. Ladies, today, not only today, but especially today, if you feel the Spirit of God leading you to just shout amen, just go for it, girl. You're not preaching. You're not teaching. You're not exercising authority over men. Don't worry. We're not going to freak out, okay? But seriously, sometimes we need to agree. And as the pastor, sometimes if I'm preaching it and I'm like, are they really? Am I ducking? How are we doing? If I hear that you're okay with it, then we're even better. But really, again, I want to encourage you with this this morning, and I want God's Word to show itself this morning. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray and ask the Spirit of God to open our ears and help us to hear it. Father, as we expose your Word this morning, remind us that it is, in fact, your Word, and that you have good things in your Word for your children. And I pray that every lady, from the youngest young lady here to the oldest lady here, would leave here in a way encouraged in their faith and for those who are Christians, that they would leave here walking away encouraged in their walk with you in some way. God, I pray that there would be challenges as well, that you would challenge. God, I pray for the men in the room, that we wouldn't just sit back and relax and think that we're somehow off the hook today. Help us to see the things that you desire and expect from us today as well. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that at those moments when, when there's, there's pushback in a heart because of this, God, that you would soften that heart and that... that, that we would see your desire in it. We would see your heart behind it. So we just ask for your guidance as we expose your word. And God, I ask that you would bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So Proverbs 31, 10 through 31, I'll give you a simple outline this morning. Before I do that, let me just give you one piece of background information that's important. Some of us and some people might think that this is kind of a tag on at the very end of the book. Like, oh man, you know, God needed to say something to women, so he threw it at the end of the book of Proverbs. There's a real important clue that that's not the case. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, lays out the purpose for the whole book. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's how the book starts. The bookend on the other end is actually one of the last verses in Proverbs 31, 30. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. 
These are intentional bookends in Proverbs to help us to see even how Proverbs 31 fits. You see, the whole book is about wisdom. And by the way, this is going to be our summer series. We're going to start on Father's Day. So dads, you're going to get Proverbs as well. We're going to go all the way from Father's Day to Labor Day, and we're going to dive into Proverbs. The whole book of Proverbs is about wisdom. How do we get it? How do we attain it? How do we act it out? This final poem, this final piece of the book of Proverbs, sums up the teaching of the entire book, and it's exemplified, as I said, in a real, ideal woman. If you're taking notes this morning and you'd like to write down a title, right at the top of your page, you're going to write down Wisdom in Action in the Life of a Wife. That's what this is about. This is a poem about wisdom in action in the life of a wife. Maybe you say, well, I'm not a wife. I'm a single gal. You could just cross out wife and write woman, and you'll be good to go. There's applications for everyone this morning. So the first thing I want us to look at in verses 10 through 12 is her character. We're going to see this gal's character, who she is, what makes her who she is. Proverbs 31.10, follow along in your copies of God's word with me, and it says this. An excellent wife, who can find? She is more precious, far more precious than jewels. Now, likely there are a variety of Bible translations. As you're looking at your copy of God's Word, it may have looked a little different, and I want to hit on an important piece there. This is kind of setting the tone for the whole thing when he says, an excellent wife, who can find? Uh, The New King James Version says, the virtuous woman. Uh, New Living Translation, virtuous and capable. The New International Version says, a wife of noble character. Christian Standard Version also says a wife of noble character. So the Hebrew word there, eshet hayil, the, the Hebrew phrase, it's an, an important phrase to help us understand who this person is. It's a, it's a label, it's a tag. Carries the idea of being virtuous, of being capable, of being valiant, and having noble character. And I want, ladies, two things to be in your minds. I want the idea of valor and nobility to be in your minds because that's what is behind that word in almost all of its usages. In fact, one of the things that some of you might get excited about, gals, is that this is actually a military term used very frequently. The Hayil part, the, the second part, talking about strength, it's a military term, and it's used throughout the Scripture to talk about armies and warriors and strength and military and valor. In fact, Gideon, this word is used to, to describe Gideon. It's also, you guys ever heard of David's mighty men? You remember those dudes in Kings, I think it's in Kings and Chronicles, Right? David's mighty men of valor. And these dudes were crazy soldiers. One of them killed 300 guys with an ox goad. That's a bad dude. They make movies about guys like that today. The writer of this poem takes a word that had all of these connotations of strength and valor and used that intentionally at the very beginning of this. In fact, uh, there's a Bible commentator by the name of Bruce Waltke. He's one of the premier uh, Proverbs evangelical Bible commentators, he points out something that lots of different scholars believe, and it's this. In that day, uh, a group of soldiers go off to battle, they go to war, they win a victory, they come back, and everybody's excited about it. They didn't have Instagram, and they didn't have X, and they didn't have all the other social media, King 5 News, that they could you know, put it up on. So what they would do is somebody would write a poem about the military victory, and it would be real pretty, and they would send it out, and people would read it all over the place about this military victory that went down. And it was called heroic poetry. That was the genre that was used to do that. And what Waltke and others point out is that this has all the markings of heroic poetry that would normally be reserved for soldiers winning a victory. There's four or five different places, I'll try to point them out as we go along, where military and strength terminology, specific terminology is used in this, and it's all going toward a poem about a woman. So when I ask, how many warrior women do we have in the room, all of the ladies are going to say amen. There you go. Warrior women. And here's the thing. Okay, I'm going to get excited about this as a dad of three girls. One of the, the, the cultural, Christian cultural misunderstandings about what it means to be a Christian woman is this idea of quiet and gentle and lowly and meek and mild. Never talks, never says anything, is always bashful, right? And some of you are like, that's not my personality, but ah! Okay? One of the things that the writer is doing here is intentionally using language that would have taken people's minds to this idea of strength and valor and applying them to to a woman. You know why that's so important? Now, this is completely different than today, but in ancient Near Eastern culture, women were praised for one thing. 
They were praised for their physical and sexual beauty. Now, I know it's a lot different than today. Okay? They didn't have social media in that day. They didn't have all of the stuff. But women were praised for that. And most scholars think that what we're actually reading here was a a polemic against that. That this woman is going to be praised for the character of her life and for the conduct that comes out of her character. For the character that she displays in just everyday aspects of life. And as we read through this list, just everyday aspects of life is what you're going to see. And we believe that this is here to show that your strength and your valor and your character comes from your character. And that as opposed to all of the messages that our culture is preaching to my daughters and to my wife and men, your daughters and your wives, despite all of the messages that our culture is preaching, church, Scripture has a greater narrative. Ladies, Scripture has a greater narrative for your value and your dignity and your worth and your beauty. This is a poem that is far from be gentle and lowly and meek and mild and quiet and never say anything and never speak up and don't ever make a decision and just bow in subservience. What I want you to see from the start is that there is intentional language that is used to portray strength and how you handle your strength is important. One of the interesting things about Proverbs is if you open some Hebrew Bibles, not all of them, but if you open some Hebrew manuscripts, you have Proverbs 31. And Proverbs 31 ends, and the very next thing on the manuscript, you know what it would be? The very next book of the Bible? It's the book of Ruth. And Proverbs 31 talks about the excellent wife, the Eshet Ha'il. Ruth 3.10, is called, she's called the exact same word. And so you read Ruth, and you look at the character of a real historical woman by the name of Ruth, and I've done a series on that, and all the things that, that Ruth char- that characterizes Ruth, and you say, some, they, they put that together intentionally. Because this is a woman of valor, and a woman of character, and a woman of worth. And what I want you to see as we start this morning is that what makes her valuable is her character. Okay? What makes her valuable isn't all the list of things that she does. It's not all of her capabilities. It's not all of the things that she does for everybody else. What makes her valuable is her character. Verse 30 says, a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Before we hear about all the things that she does, we hear about who she is. She's an excellent wife. Ladies, you're valuable for your character. You're valuable for who you are, not just for what you do. And sometimes as Christians, if we, if we say you're valuable for what you do, it's just a different list than, than what culture says. I need you to hear that you're valuable for your character and for who you are. Verses 11 and 12, we men get to kind of hear how we're involved. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. Now, that word gain is an interesting one. It's specifically the word for plunder. So, guys, if your wife is a pirate, this is her verse. Ladies, if you like pirates, just write that down. He will have no lack of gain. Victor spoils, plunder. It's another military term, ter- terminology. It says she does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Guys, look at me. A, a trustworthy wife is a blessing. Amen, guys? This is our chance, right? A trustworthy wife is a blessing to her husband. This man's going to show up at the beginning, intentionally, I believe, He's going to show up right in the middle, verse 23, and then he's going to show up at the very end. And at the very end, we're going to hear him actually talk about his wife. It's going to be pretty cool. But he shows up in each of these places so that we're reminded and so that the original reader was reminded that a trustworthy wife is a blessing to her husband. As I see it, Proverbs 31 puts flesh on Genesis 2.18. Remember Genesis 2.18? God had created everything, and he said, man, I did a really good job. It's all really good. He looks at the guy over there by himself. You remember what he said? Not good. He said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And I believe that Proverbs 31 does a lot to help us flesh out what that looks like. We'll, We'll talk more about that as we get into other passages on the husband. But guys, I want us to see that, that a trustworthy wife And ladies, I want you to know, married ladies, that you're a blessing to your husband. 
So that's her character. She's an excellent, strong, she's a valorous woman. If you have that character, I believe out of that character will come point number two, verses 13 through 27, is her conduct. Verses 13 through 21 talks about, and we'll see her conduct, 13 through 27. That's a lot of passages. I'm going to read through them. And here's, here's a couple of things. Here's what I'm going to do. There's going to be some culturally bound things. When it's talking about her shearing sheep, if that's your thing, that's cool, right? But it doesn't mean everybody has to shear sheep. There's some culturally bound pieces, but there's some timeless principles involved as well. And, and I'll help to try to pull out some timeless principles. But here's what my job is not. My job is not to apply this general principle to your specific life. Sometimes pastors get themselves in trouble because they try to make really specific applications rather than general principles. So I'm going to give the principles, and the Spirit of God, hopefully, if, as you're open to that, will say, this is how I need to apply this to my life. And again, we're going to go quickly through verses 13 through 27, and I'll stop at a couple places and maybe make some more comments. So verse 13, let's look at her conduct. Let's look at some of the things that she does. She seeks wool and flax, and she works with willing hands. So again, whether she sheared the sheep or whether she bought the wool or whether she, you know, cut down the flax stalks or whether she bought it, she was resourceful in gathering supplies for things. She was resourceful and industrious. This is an important just everyday characteristic of this woman, that her conduct was resourceful and her conduct was industrious, okay? Some of you, this is like the trip to Joanne, right? I gotta go gather resources. Now for others of you, I like to point out, this is a trip to Home Depot, Okay, there we go. Thank you. I knew I'd get one. And that's perfectly cool. My lovely wife, not too long ago, I went over, I, I left on a trip for a few days, and I've been very delinquent at these uh, dresser drawers. My daughters had dressers, and the drawers wouldn't close. I won't say it's because of too many clothes, but the drawers wouldn't close. My girl went to Ikea, bought the Ikea stuff, loaded it in the van, brought it home, and put it together. And you know what I said? An excellent wife who can find. She's more precious than rubies, baby. Woo! But you think about those things, gals. You don't get, sometimes you don't get the credit you deserve for just doing some of those things, right? Just being able to be industrious and be resourceful and see a problem and fix a problem. See a problem and not just nag him about it, but see the problem and be able to fix it. That's an important piece of what he's saying. Verse 14. Oh, actually, I want to make sure that I hit the end of verse 13. It says, she works with willing hands. That's willing, not begrudging. Okay? Verse 14. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. Right? The ships go out, and they go to the foreign countries, and they find the delicacies, and they find the special things, and then they bring them in. And she says, that's like what she does. Now, I'll point to that word afar is an important word. It's actually, uh, in the Hebrew language, it's a really a technical term. The transliteration, she brings her food from afar. The technical term afar there is actually the word Costco. So you'll want to write that down, okay? I'm going to circle that one and say it's biblical. Uh, I've been waiting all week to use that. I actually had somebody come up to me after this first service and said, man, you were saying that? And I was thinking, say Costco, say Costco. And then you said Costco. I was like, that's because we all, all men think alike. That's why. 14 and 15 get us in trouble sometimes. I'll tell you why. She's like ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it's yet night, provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. This is one of those ones where you gals start to get a little twitchy, right? What do you mean I got to get up while it's still dark? What do you mean I got to go out and get the food? I got to do all the shopping and all the cooking? The text is not saying that the wife has to do all the shopping and all the cooking, okay? It's not saying that she has to do that. What it is saying is that she is committed to her home and her family's well-being, especially in this area. She's committed to her home and to her family's well-being. She's putting the well-being of her household above the comfort of herself. I made mention of this in the first service, and I'll see what you think. Food is often more than just food. Food is often soul care, right? Right? Food is often care for somebody's soul and somebody's life. Yeah, it is, right? You make a meal and have the kids uh, sit down and everybody eats and then you spend time talking together. You, somebody comes and they're crying or they're hurting or they're upset, a family member, and you make them some cookies or some food or whatever it is and you talk to them through that. 
most of us are going to see that food is sold here if I ever get them preaching this morning, right? You're going to go barbecue something, or you're going to buy something, or whatever it is, and you're going to eat food together. And I would say that a piece of this, she's like the ships of the merchants. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it's yet night, provides food for her households, and portion for her maidens. That this is about her being committed to her home and family. This is not saying that every woman has to cook every meal. Some of you guys love to cook, and God forbid, some of you guys might even be better cooks than your wives, okay? That's okay, but gals, be part of the process, right? Be there, because there's more going on. There's more going on than just throwing some nuggets at them to make sure that they don't die, right? There's more going on. And I think one of the things we see of the excellent woman is that she's involved there, and she's committed to her family. She's committed to making this stuff happen. If your lives are so busy... And mom is so busy outside of home that she can't do that at all. You want to reevaluate some of that. Verse 16. She considers a field and buys it. I'll push pause on that one too. She considers a field and buys it. She is engaged in mindful business. If she's considering a field, I mean, she's thinking about it. She sees something that's for sale. She considers the field. Will this be profitable for my family? Will this help my family? If, I, if we buy this, what are going to be the, the end result? She's engaged in mindful business. One of the, I think, problematic ways that we've, again, viewed women at times is that they're not supposed to have any part of the finances. They're not supposed to have any part in making these big decisions. And for some of us as, as men, we've propagated that to say, this is my responsibility. You just kind of sit over there and keep the fridge full and keep my belly full. That's not biblical, Okay. She's engaged in mindful business, and she's also entrusted with a big financial decision. I offered this to the first service, and I'll offer it to you, and I want to make sure. This is me applying. Okay, this is, this is my thoughts about this, trying to understand what Scripture says, but this is not a biblical mandate. What I think that this would look like or could look like is the wife sees a, a big purchase that needs to be made in the house. Maybe it's a car. Maybe it's something else. And the wife sees a purchase that needs to be made and talks with the husband about it. Then she goes and researches online, thinks about it, talks about it, uh, figures out the price, figures out the budget. What is that going to look like? Comes together with her husband because he's got responsibility and there's headship involved as well. But comes together, they talk about it. This is why we need it. This is what it's going to do. This is how it's going to help us. They work together. This is how we're going to pay for it and budget and all of those things. And he says, that sounds great. Thumbs up. And then she makes it happen. And for some of us, what I just said is very different than how you grew up or how you manage your life right now. But when it says that she considers a field and buy it, buys it, I would suggest that the husband is trusting his wife with the financial decision. You know what he's not doing, guys? He's not abdicating his responsibility. Well, I don't want to deal with it. You figure it out. No. But he's entrusting her with something that she desires to do, that she wants to do, that she wants to figure out, and he's empowering her in that. Related to that, the second half of the, of the verse says, with the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. So we see that her endeavors are productive. The fruit of her hands means that there's productivity there. She, she's made that, and then she plants a vineyard. Verse 17, she dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong to point out that this is not metaphorical strength okay i see this the little smirks where is he going to go with this one <laughs> is he going to go there kind of <laughs> this gal cared for herself physically okay this gal cared for herself physically she dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong here's what he's talking about in this context functional strength for physically demanding work okay Functional strength for physically demanding work. Does this mean that she's got to be at the gym pumping iron? Is it, again, this is between you and the Holy Spirit as to how this applies, but I want you to think about this. The functional strength for physically demanding work, her, her strength, the strength was for her work, not for her Instagram photos. The strength was for her work, not because she's got a beach vacation coming up soon. And by the way, if you're wondering, like, does any of that matter? There's a book, just two books over, is really good on that whole thing. Song of Solomon, read that one. But here, here, what he's talking, what the 
writer's talking about is functional strength. And here's how I would apply that. That this woman wants to be a physical asset to her family and not a physical liability. She wants to be a physical asset to her family and not a physical liability. And we realize that there are the range of illnesses and diseases and sicknesses and chronic things that we all deal with. But I think that the question that the excellent woman would ask is how can I still be an asset and not be a liability? What does it look like for me to care for myself physically? For some, that might mean just getting off the chair and going for a short walk a couple times a day. This applies to the 15-year-old, the 20-year-old, just like it applies to the 70, 75, 80, 90-year-old. A couple gals in my life who I know who are like some of the strongest, physical strongest gals, are one is in her 80s and the other is in her 90s. But what does that look like for you? I feel like we have, in some, in a lot of places, we have this victim mentality. And it's really easy for us to take the victim mentality into our pain and into our illnesses and into our physical things and make excuses rather than asking the question, how can I do whatever it is that God allows me to do physically right now to be an asset, to be helpful to my family? Verse 18 she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. So again, there's profitability in the things that she does. Her lamp does not go out at night. And some have misused this in verse 15. Verse 15, she gets up while it's still night. Her lamp does not go out at night. And the ladies are like, do I ever get to sleep? Right? And some have said, a good woman has to get up early and stay up late. You'll notice that the text that never actually says that. It doesn't actually say that she's got to do both every day. Ladies, this is that spot, right? Uh, let's try it again. She doesn't have to do both every day. There we go. Okay, good. And it doesn't mean that she has to do it without a nap. There we go. Even better. In addition to that, in that day, a lamp was like their version of ADT home security, right? And so many people believe that that's what this is actually getting at, is it's talking about being reliable and responsible with that security piece. That her lamp doesn't go out at night because she's been reliable because she's been responsible, and she's done the job that God gave her to do. So there's reliability and responsibility. Verse 19, she, it says, she puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. In other words, she's skillful, okay? This was an implement that they would use in that day to carry out a specific task. She knew how to use it. Now, if this applies to power tools with you ladies, more power to you, more power tool to you. It doesn't mean you have to, but it doesn't mean you can't. But what I do believe that he's teaching here is that there's some skillfulness. You're not this helpless gal who always has to wait and always has to figure, have somebody help her figure things out. She's skillful and she's learned how to do it. She didn't even have YouTube, by the way, and she figured out how to use it. Verse 21, or verse 20, she opens her hand to the poor, reaches out her hands to the needy. She's generous. She has a heart for people. And I would say this, um, there's something called mama bear syndrome that works in American culture. It's usually younger gals with small kids. Mama bear syndrome is I'm going to care for my family, even if that means I have to run over your small children with a car. We know this, right? Now, this is, you can see this at amusement parks. You can see this at uh, uh, little league fields all across the country, right? And I'm going to take care of my little angel. And if I have to, like, smash your little angel in order to take care of my little angel, I'm going to take care of my little angel. That's a heart for your own family, but no heart for anybody else. This gal has a heart for her family, but she has a heart for people, that she's generous. Verse 21, she's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Scarlet was like a costly wool. She's prepared. She's not freaked out. She's not worried about what's going to happen in life because she's prepared. Verse 22, it says, she makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. We'll get to the second half of that in a minute, but she makes bed coverings for herself. Again, commentators are kind of like all over the place on what this means, but the only other place that this idea comes up is in chapter 7, verse 16, where it's talking about the adulterous woman, and she says she makes covering for her bed in order to lure a young, simple man in so that she can have an affair with him. And so some have said that maybe this alludes to like a, a, a woman of sexual integrity, that she makes bed coverings for herself as saying, as opposed to trying to draw 
someone in, and Proverbs 7, this she is that person. Now, a special Mother's Day gift is verse 22b. Ladies, you're all going to want to look at that. You're all going to want to circle that. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Now, I'd love to give you my thoughts, but you'll use them against me. Your husbands would especially use them against me. So I'll read another commentator, and you can take it up with him. He, uh, one commentator said, her character and industry, in other words, her character and her industriousness, afforded her the luxury of an, in, of an occasional indulgence. Ooh, I like that. Ladies, you like that one? Happy Mother's Day, right? Do you know what he's saying? If you're a good, solid, trustworthy woman of character, every once in a while, you deserve to be spoiled. Come on, there. So this is a little bit. Some of you are like, I'm not sure. And the thing is, is we're, we're walking through this, and I, some of you are like, is that really what the text says? Well, she's clothed in fine linen and purple. And some of you are like, well, that's because her husband's going to be a king one day. Yeah, but if her husband's going to be a king, would she have to do all the other work that she's, got to, that she's doing here as well? Now, this is a normal, everyday gal, okay? This is just a normal, everyday gal, has a normal, everyday life, and her clothing is fine linen and purple. Why? Because she's been industrious, she's been productive, and all those things. And I want to say, gals, every once in a while, you deserve something nice. It's Mother's Day. It's okay. If you're a woman who is the kind of woman that this is, if you're an excellent wife, your husband can trust you with his credit card. Right? He can trust you at Nordstrom. We're not sure. <laughs> all the guys are like, well, I'm not sure. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's okay. At the end of the day, not every piece of clothing has to stay Kirkland. Just a, if you want it to, look, if you want it to, that, that, again, this is me. It's not in the text. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Guys, sometimes we need to give our wives something nice if they are looking for it. I can tell I'm going to get emails. Verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. One of the reasons that feminists, secular feminists, hate this is because every time you see the guy, it seems like he's just lazy and not doing anything. And that's actually not the case at all. But what you see in a text like this is that she was a huge reason for his success. And I want to say publicly that you ladies are a huge reason for the successes of many of your husbands. Okay? Wow, guys, good work. But it's true, and we need to tell them. Like, for many of us men, we can't do the things that we do without the support that we have from our wives. Genesis 2.18. And I would argue that we were never intended to. Okay? And I'm using generalities. I understand there's the gift of singleness, and there are seasons of singleness, and those kinds of things. But as a general rule, Proverbs, as a general rule, that's how it works. That she's a big part of his success. And as this mother's telling her son, look for this woman... That's what she's telling him. Hey, do you know how many guys I see are, whose lives are train wrecks, ministries are train wrecks, and it's not their fault, it's their wife? She makes linen garments and sells them, verse 24. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to merchants. Some have used this to say, well, the wife should have a stay, uh, like an at-home business, different things like that. The issue isn't stay at home, work, anything like that. The issue is, like, productivity. And again, she sets her mind to something, and she's a productive part of her family. Again, I said this in the first service as it came to my mind, and I want to say it again. Like, an excellent wife is financially productive and not a financial drain on her family. But here's, here's an interesting application to that. I got a buddy in the restaurant business. He said that after COVID, after 2020, he had a really hard time... Um, uh, rehiring moms, like moms with young kids. You know why? Because they figured out during COVID that they were actually paying more for childcare to put their kids in daycare than they were making at the job for which they had the daycare to take care of their child. And it would actually save their family money if they stopped working and stayed at home and took care of their kids. Like it happened, okay? It is not the job of this pulpit or this church because it's not specifically laid out in scripture to say anything about the status, not, I'm sorry, to say definitively that stay at home or work or not work is the thing. But what we see over and over and over again is she prioritizes her household. 
she prioritizes her family. Verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing. She laughs at the time to come. Strength and dignity. I think this is an interior strength now because it's followed with the word dignity. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She laughs at the time to come. You know what that means? There's security. This is a secure woman. She's physically secure. She's emotionally secure. She's spiritually secure. She's not needy. Verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Teaching of kindness are two real specific words, Torah and Hesed. And those are words that mean the, the word of the law of God and the love of God. The gals, one of the things that you do that we need so much, and, and Paul tells Timothy and Titus, for the older women to train the younger women. And that begins with the ones, if you have them, that share your last name, right? But teaching of wisdom, teaching of kindness, all of those things are such vital, important pieces of, of why we have mama. A little illustration. I was trying to explain something to the girls last week. We're sitting around the table. Food was involved, which I didn't make, thank Jesus, but food was involved. We're sitting around. We're doing a, a Bible study on roles of women, and I spent, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes waxing eloquent, started in Genesis, built the theology, went to the pastoral epistles, really laid it out nicely for them, and they all looked at me like, huh? And then Lynn's in about 30 seconds goes, da 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 and they're like, oh, yeah, okay, Dad, why didn't you just say that? Why well, leave the theological foundation? Give me a break. Right? Sometimes moms can say it in a way that just makes it easier to understand. Now, Dad, that doesn't mean that you just usurp your authority. You know, that doesn't mean you just bail on it and say, well, she can say it better. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. You take responsibility for spiritual leadership, right? But mom is an important piece of that process. Verse 27. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. This kind of sums up the conduct piece. She looks well to the ways of her household. Ladies, that's what I'm talking about right there. What's the orientation of your heart? What's the orientation of your mind? What's the orientation of your priorities toward your household? Because I think that's where we can really lay out a, a biblical understanding. And for each of you as families, you've got to discern what that looks like. What is that priority toward your household? And does not eat the bread of idleness means this. She's not lazy. Okay? I have seen gals where this is the case. They extol all the virtues. Not, not here. I, seriously, I mean this seriously. Not here at this church. But I've known gals who extol all the virtues of being a stay-at-home mom. And I'm going to stay at home and I'm going to take care of my kids and, and all those things. Which we would say that's great. But then what at least in a couple of instances I've seen, is what that looked like was a load of laundry or two, make sure something was on the table for dinner real quick, as well as six to eight hours of doom scrolling on social media or daytime TV or online shopping or just whatever she wanted to do. And ladies, that's not biblical, right? G.K. Chesterton, I don't have it in here. It's in a blog that I read, but G.K. Chesterton said when, a, when, when someone calls himself, when a lady calls herself mom, she, what she actually means is about a dozen different things, right? About a dozen different things that, that she does. Because really, to be mom is a heavy responsibility. And it's a full-time job. There you go. Good, right? Absolutely. And we value the things that mom does. Because a good gal and a good mom, there's no way you can be lazy. And here's what we see as we wrap it up. And we see character. And out of character comes conduct. And if your character is leading to your conduct, and you have the conduct that God desires, then her commendation is going to come. Her commendation we see in verses 28 through 31. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Now, did anybody get a Mother's Day card with that actually on it today? Anybody? Yeah, maybe. All right, there we go. Yeah. That's a Mother's Day verse. Her children rise up and call her blessed. But you know what? You know how many funerals I've been at of moms, of grandmas, of 80-plus-year-old mom, where her children rose up and called her blessed. They came up and they stood right here and they called her blessed for her character and for her conduct. That's what this is talking about. Her children rise up and call her blessed. 
her husband also, and he praises her. You guys ready? Gentlemen, this is our verse. You'll notice quotation marks, or you should, because this is a direct quotation. This is when we get to hear from the dude. We get to hear from a good husband. So guys, when the Bible tells us what husbands say, we write it down. We set a reminder. He says, many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. That's not much, because most men are men of few words. Those are good words. Most of you gals would be pretty excited if you got that on your card. Right? You know what he's saying? He's saying there's lots of great gals out there. But for me, you're the one. There's lots of great gals out there doing lots of great things. But for me, you're my standard. You're my standard of beauty. You're my standard of productivity. You're my standard of awesomeness and amazingness and strength and valor. And he's saying, I am thankful for you. Guys, we need to remind ourselves to be thankful for our wives. We need to remind ourselves to be thankful for the things that they've done for us. And look, I'm right here. And you all know, you can talk to her. Like, I'm not perfect. We all could do a better job. Wait a minute, what? <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> I asked for it. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> She'll pay you later. <laughs> yeah. But what I love is you actually get to hear him say, and so guys, I would just suggest that we make a habit, even if you need to set a reminder on your phone, <laughs> make a habit of telling your wife how thankful you are for her. Verse 30, charm is deceitful, beauty is in vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Ladies, listen. Women today are bombarded with secular ideology of what it means to be strong, of what it means to be valuable, of what it means to be valiant women. That message is everywhere, okay? In secular culture, in more feminist-leaning church culture, you are being bombarded with what it means to be strong with what it means to be valiant, with what it means to be valuable and worth something. Why not go to the scriptures? Let God tell you what it means to be valuable. And here it does. He says a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. There are lots of gals out there with no interest in Jesus who could do that whole list that I read, or most of that list in 13 through 27. Right? That's why character is so important. That's why your walk with the Lord is so important and so meaningful. There's an argument here that the verb tense is used throughout this actually go to show that this is not something that one real woman did all the time every day, but this is something that she continued to grow in all the time. And it's what she did over the course of a lifetime, okay? And one of the things that you see her most praised for, again, is her walk with God. And for us, here, now, this side of the cross... That's her Christian faith. That's where the gospel intersects with Proverbs 31. And so, gals, if you're trying to walk a life, but you're not living with Christ, you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, you're not walking in relationship with Him, we could do a lot of good stuff and still not be what God wants us to be. So that's the, ch the first challenge, is to accept Christ and let Him change your heart and your life and then move forward. Verse 31 is how we'll close this morning. It says, give her the fruit of her hand. Again, this is her commendation. And her kids and her husband have, have probably, at least privately, have praised her. She's been praised. She's known for her character, her, her love for the Lord. Give her of the fruit of her hand and let her works praise her in the gates. Let her works praise her in the gates. That's what we're here to do today. We're here to publicly praise the women who are sitting in front of me, the women who were here in the first service, the women who are going to watch this online. Because we've got a lot of excellent women. And here's the thing, okay? As Lauren said earlier, maybe you're like, maybe you're still seeing this and you're like, oh, i got a lot of stuff to measure up. Strong character produces steadfast conduct and it's not our job to just try to measure up, but it is your job to not shy away from the areas of your conduct where the Lord's working on you, okay? There may be areas where the Spirit of God is saying, hey, this needs to change, this needs to grow. That's a good thing. Don't shy away from that. But also, don't live in guilt. 
okay? If, you, if you're sitting there, gals, right now, and you just feel this overwhelming sense of guilt, I can promise you that's not from the Spirit of God, okay? And what I want you to do is live in grace and to realize that as we rise up from here in a minute, you're going through, and I'm going to pray for you, and as you move out from here, that God wants your heart, God wants to work on your character, God wants to develop you into the woman that he wants you to be, and then out of that comes all of this conduct stuff. But focus on your heart, focus on your character, and at the end of that, your works will praise you in the gates. And so what I'm going to ask right now, the men are going to stay seated, and all the girls and, and women are going to stand. And I know it was awkward in the first service. It'll be so again, but please stand. I believe that we have excellent women standing in front of me. Okay? I believe that we have excellent women standing in front of me. Men, do we believe that? Right? I believe that we have good, godly, God-fearing women standing in front of me. But I also believe that we have people who are under attack by the world, by the flesh, and by the devil standing in front of me. I believe that we need each other. I believe that we, men, need you ladies to be strong. And I know that you need us to be strong. I want to pray for you this morning, first of all, praising God for you and the work that you're doing. I'm also going to pray because I know there's got to be somebody here or watching online who's hurting right now. And I want to pray for you in that as well. But as much as we talk about needing strong men, and we do, man, we need strong women right beside them. So I'm thankful to God for you guys. Let's bow and let's pray. Father, thank you for your standard. Thank you for your word. God, I know we can quibble over the details of some of the application here, but it seems that it's just clear from your word that your desire and design is women of character, women of godly character, their relationship with you their heart for you, their love for you, their love for other people. God, I want to commend the ladies who are standing before me today to you. I want to thank you and praise you for them and for their character. God, I realize there's not a perfect woman standing in front of me. we got a lot of gals here who have walked with you for a short time or for a long time, and we're thankful for them. God, I pray for the young gals here, for my daughters, for the young teenagers, the girls who are younger than that. God, I, I just pray because I know that they're under so much attack from so many things. God, I pray that you would continue to help them to see their value and their worth in you and who you've created them and their character. God, I pray for the ladies who are walking through the, the young kid stage of life because what a, what a time, what a, what a crazy time. We're so thankful for that. We're thankful for the character that they're building into their children. God, I pray that you would help them to do so more and more on those days where they're just sitting there looking at life saying, what in the world am I doing? Would you just strengthen them for that task? God, for the gal who's here maybe who would love to be mom and is not, God, would you uphold and strengthen her as well? God, I pray for our gals who are middle-aged, older age, the ones who are really tasked with continuing the legacy, continuing to grow the younger. God, I pray that you would, again, help them to see and to realize, especially for our gals who are in their 70s, 80s, to see that this is their game, that this is not them on the bench or on the sideline, but we need them. God, I pray that you would encourage the gals who need to be encouraged today, that you would challenge the gals who need to be challenged today, and, Father, that you would challenge us as men today here as well. But God, ultimately, I pray that you would be honored and you would be lifted up, that we would all walk out of here having a better understanding of your design for this world and this life, and that we would have a better understanding of our part to play in it. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would challenge and encourage and strengthen today. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, if you would stand with the ladies as well, you can put your arm around your wife or your mom if you want.